Hi, Kelly, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, um, I just want to let you know I'm going to disconnect with my computers. I'm going to reconnect on another setup, so I'll need the host again. Okay, sounds good. Perfect, thanks. No problem. Thank Kelly, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Denik, you'll have to promote uh, the Tri Global yourself.
Hey, Matt. Hey, Eli. How you doing, sir? Good, how are you? Oh, just living the dream. <laughs> I, I see my son pop up because I'm talking to you. Sorry, Tim, I should have talked to you first. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dad. Good morning, Mr. Mayor.
Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bon après-midi, mesdames et messieurs. We'll begin our meeting of the Finance and Economic Development Committee in one minute. On va commencer la réunion de finances et de développement économique dans une minute. Thank you. Merci. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues and uh, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue à la Comité des Finances et de Développement Économique pour la Ville d'Ottawa pour le 5 octobre. Welcome to the Finance and Economic Development Committee for the uh, 5th of October. Uh, this is um, a reminder that we're on Zoom and you know all of the rules that we've been following for the last 18 months. Before we proceed, I'll do a quick roll call of members. Uh, Councillor Cloutier. Present. Councillor DeRuz. Here. Councillor El Shantiri. Present. Councillor Gower. Here. Councillor Hubley. Here. Councillor Luloff. Present. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Tierney. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Dudas. Here. A declaration of interest, declaration de conflit d'intérêt. There are none. Adoption of minutes, adoption de process verbal pour le 7 septembre, for the 7th of September. Carried? Carried. Carried. So we'll go through the uh, consent agenda and, and deal with all the items in public uh, first, and then we have an in-camera item with respect to LRT legal updates. So item number one is Finance Services Department, Direction General des Services des Finances, Small Business Property Tax Subclass. We have a presentation on that. We'll come back to that. Next is Prudent Investor Update, Mise à jour sur la règle de l'investisseur prudent. Received. Innovative Client Services Department Service uh, Novotel pour la clientèle. We have three members uh, of the public who want to speak to this. Uh, my understanding is um, if they see that it's going to pass, then uh, they don't have to speak and, and wait. But uh, does anyone have questions or comments on uh, this initiative? I know it was Councillor Dudas, I think, that brought this forward. Did you want to just say a, a brief word and then we'll ask the delegates if they have anything to say, Councillor, since this is your item? Yes, I, I just wanted to say I'm so incredibly pleased to see that this, this report has come before committee and that this is a great first step and will help us ensure that we're maximizing the benefit of every tax dollar as we build back from COVID-19 while looking at uh, mobilizing our grassroots economy. So I really do appreciate all the work that city staff have put into this, that our community partners have done so. And I wanted to particularly thank Councillor King for his contributions to, to this uh, motion and to this report. So thank you very much. Great. So uh, Phil Robinson, um, it believes there's, there's consensus to pass this. Uh, do you have any um, comments, or we'll come back to you if you'd like. Otherwise, um, you can say you agree with the report. Just let Phil in. And the same with Michael Muir and uh, Ian Bing. We have uh, those three in the uh, queue, Madam Clerk. We're trying to promote them so they can speak. Okay, so we're, we're trying to promote them. So maybe in the interim, we'll just hold that for a moment and go back. Uh, status update, FEDCO inquiries and motions for period ending September 23rd, received. Received. Uh, election signs bylaw review. Carried. If I can say something, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm glad we can carry this. This is a motion I put in 2019. I just want to take this opportunity to thank staff, uh, uh, specifically from the election office, without naming them. They did a great job back and forth with uh, my office, and we landed in a good position. But I want to thank staff for their hard work on this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Right. Thank you. Uh, on the motion carried, the report. Carried. Uh, carried. Ottawa yeah. Award Boundary Review 2020 Implementation Report. Any questions or comments on the ward boundary issue? Carried. 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 Planning infrastructure and economic development services, uh, service de planification de l'infrastructure, item seven, acquisition of decommissioned railway corridor being part of the Beachburg Railway subdivision. Councillor uh, El Chantiri knows this file very well. And On also, uh, well, I would love to carry it, and uh, it's a good news for the city and it's good news for the resident, both Canada North and West Carlton Marsh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, on the uh, report, Dr. Gay. Carrie. Carrie. Uh, lease renewal, 370 Catherine Street. Carried. Carried. Uh, Councillor's item, Councillor Fleury, Sports Commissioner update. Received. 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 So we'll come back to uh, the item uh, that we held um, with uh, delegations. Uh, have we managed to get Phil and Michael and Ian? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, who's that, please? Uh, that was uh, Phil Robinson. Yeah, hi, Phil. Um, all right. the, uh, the committee seems to be willing to support this unanimously. Uh, did you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I would, if that's okay. I appreciate yeah. how, how busy your agenda is today, uh -huh. but I think... I think it's important uh, for councillors to understand the potential benefits and the community benefits that could come from adoption of this report. Um, I really appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Phil Robinson. I'm the executive director for the Community Laundry Co-op, as well as our social enterprise Community Impact Laundry. We're located at Hartwood House uh, in the Vanier Overbrook area. Uh, our board welcomes this report on social procurement, and I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I just want to tell you a little bit about how we provide services to low-income and marginalized residents, and how the recommendations in this report will enable us to provide more community benefits to the community. Uh, the Community Laundry Co-op is a charity, and we offer an essential service, which is access to self-serve laundry for low-income members of the community, including many seniors, single parents, new Canadians, and people with physical, developmental, and mental health challenges. Over 95% of our members live below the poverty line. But our members receive more than clean clothes at the co-op. When they come to the co-op, they have access to a social service worker who can provide them with personalized support, referrals, and counseling. And we're reaching people who are members of traditionally hard-to-reach populations. We have a voucher system, which is used largely by the uh, homeless population, um, people who get the health benefits and the dignity of wearing clean clothes through our services. To help offset the costs of the programs we offer, we founded Community Impact Laundry, which is an accredited social enterprise through Buy Social Canada. And this social enterprise offers employment and job training to people who experience barriers to employment. And our customers include uh, a range of businesses, nonprofits, uh, health practitioners, as well as households. And we've been working really hard with organizations like the Ottawa Community Foundation, as well as the Center for Social and Economic Development to increase our capacity so that we can take on large clients like the city. And if we had the opportunity to get contracts with the city, anchor contracts, it would ensure our long-term sustainability and it would allow us to continue to grow. And the more we grow, the more community benefits we can offer to the residents of Ottawa. At the Community Laundry Co-op, we're changing lives one load at a time. And we're hoping that one day we'll be able to establish um, our model in other low-income areas across the city. And the recommendations in this report will help us to do just that. And uh, I thank you for your time and for your support uh, for the recommendations contained in this report. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Menard, you have a question for the delegation? 
Yes, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, hi, Phil. Nice to see you. Uh, thank you for your delegation. I just wanted to congratulate you on you know your new position at uh, I guess it's not so new anymore, but Community Laundry Co-op, and just ask a question just so the community is aware of it. My understanding is is people can go there and uh, do laundry for you know in in uh, various locations. Maybe you want to expand on this for um, a very low amount. Uh, I guess it's one dollar a wash, one dollar a dry. Um, and that includes uh, soap, bleach, fabric softener, coffee. Do I have that right? Is there more to it that you can explain about this service in our community? It's just for residents that, that may require this. Um, I'm thinking about students coming back to school now, uh, living in our community and other um, folks in need. So if you could just go into a bit more detail, that'd be helpful. Thank you very much for your question, Councillor Menard. Uh, yes, it is. What you uh, stated is accurate, that um, our membership, as I noted, is 95% uh, below the poverty line. And for $1 for washing and $1 for drying a load of laundry, when in the city, your average is closer to 6 or over $6 to do a load of laundry. Uh, and the people who come here, we do supply all the materials, the detergents and that. But what makes us really different is the relationship that relationships that happen when people come to do their laundry. We, um, by having an on-site social service worker, we're able to, to build relationships with people who might otherwise fall through the cracks and we can provide them support and build the community. Uh, uh, so whether it's issues of housing, accessing, uh, language training, employment supports, uh, you name it, uh, we're there to provide the support to people who may not have uh, the courage or knowledge to, to know to walk into a community health center. So we can help direct them to that. We can also contact uh, different service providers on their behalf. Uh, so it's a different model to providing social services. And uh, for the over 200 members we have here, the the stories you would hear from how the co-op has changed some people's lives, um, there wouldn't be a dry eye in the house. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, uh, Phil, and thanks very much, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, next is Michael Murr, Executive Director, Centre for Social Enterprise Development. Michael, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you very much, Mayor. Members of committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm here today on behalf of the Center for Social Enterprise Development and here to show our strong support for the report that is before you and the motions that committee is considering. Um, I think the inclusion of sustainability in the procurement bylaw, along with the sole source rationale, is, is really important as we move towards equitable economic recovery and long term community wealth building. Since 2013, CSED has been working in the community to help the social enterprise ecosystem reach its full potential. So we do that by working on the supply side with organizations like the Community Laundry Co-op and its commercial impact service. Uh, we do that as well on the demand side by working with purchasers to help them integrate social enterprise into their own supply chains. And we do that by connecting both supply and demand through various activities like our annual social enterprise conference and other networking activities. C said, we're also uh, proud to be the regional partner for Buy Social Canada and also proud to be a member of the Ottawa Community Foundation's social enterprise platform. So as a social enterprise enabler, we, we feel very strongly then that the motions before you uh, will help the city as an important anchor institution to help the city build back stronger and to develop more healthy communities. It's a strong tool in the toolkit that sits alongside of other important initiatives like diverse suppliers and making sure that there are training, apprenticeship and employment opportunities for equity seeking groups. So it's very much a tool in the toolkit. Uh, if we think of Ottawa specifically in social enterprise, there are about 125, excuse me, 110 uh, social enterprises uh, that are listed in CSED's SE directory, which is available through csedottawa.ca. And if we look at those 110 social enterprises, they provide a wide range of services. So everything from catering, cleaning services, uh, language interpretation, property maintenance, uh, training and education. And uh, I wanted just to highlight a couple of, uh, of them specifically. Um, 
and certainly I won't speak more about uh, uh, Phil and the great work that Phil is doing at the uh, Community Laundry um, uh, Co-op. Uh, but commercial, uh, the Causeway's commercial cleaning service is an example. Uh, Causeway Work Centre uh, operates four social enterprises in the city. Uh, this is their newest, and they provide that cleaning and sanitization service as a way to provide employment opportunities for people who are experiencing barriers in the community. Uh, the second one I would highlight is the Open Collaboration for Cognitive Accessibility. It's a big title. Uh, this is a social enterprise that's quite new and it's quite unique. So they provide a platform for technology developers, accessibility specialists, and business to collaborate with persons of all cognitive abilities. So the goal there is to create uh, a society, a community that is more inclusive. Uh, and third, I would mention is Dallow Property Maintenance. And this is an organization that is not a stranger to, uh, to the city. Uh, Dallow was in fact created as an initiative between the Ottawa Community Foundation, uh, Ottawa Community Housing, uh, with city support, as a way to provide a social enterprise that would employ Somali youth. C said was very uh, pleased to be part of that initiative as well. Since that early development, this is a great example. Dallow started as that emerging social enterprise and has know. now gone on to the point where they can uh, now compete in the open market. So the path forward is not going to be, uh, there will be some bumps. It's not easy to, to operate a business. Certainly it's not easy to operate a social enterprise. CSED is committed to doing its part. So we're very committed to working with uh, the city of Ottawa and we are committed to doing things that would include third-party validation. So using the social enterprise directory is a way to make sure that we understand um, the social enterprises that are in the community that can be referenced by city staff Secondly, is to promote and educate social enterprises, making sure that they understand how to engage with the city and its procurement processes. Third is to support the continued development of social enterprise capacity through, through our training and consulting service. Fourth is to continue to create additional market demand. So the city of Ottawa as an anchor institution and others can help to further develop and support social enterprise markets. And finally, to work as a member of the Ottawa Community Benefit Coalition. And this is to help ensure that we can maximize the community benefits that come out of infrastructure and development um, uh, projects. So finally, right, I'd just you. like to uh, say... Sorry, Michael. Michael we're uh, out of time. We have a questioner. Council yes, Flurry, thank, you. thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And good morning, uh, Michael. <clears throat> I, 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 too, really support this report. I want to thank... Uh, Councillor Dudas and, and Councillor uh, Councillor Cavanaugh and Councillor King for for their work in terms of gender equity and in terms of uh, BIPOC communities. This is good in terms of an organization and its relationship uh, with the city in terms of maybe something that's less traditional. But I, I'm curious to hear from you in relation to our ability or or what we should be doing in terms of the contracts we attribute. I'm thinking more specifically on infrastructure, but it can apply on a lot of things. As we give a lot of contracts out, what are the opportunities for a social enterprise in the private setting, but on contracts provided by the city? So instead of a more direct direct relationship with a social enterprise, how do you see the private sector responsibility and, and opportunities there? I guess I'm curious to hear more of from your perspective on that. Thanks very much, Councillor. And, and I would say that as, you know, while we're talking today about city hall procurement and, uh, and the direct uh, support and, and supply from social enterprise, I think as well, um, if we think of larger suppliers to the city of Ottawa, so if we think of tier one and tier two suppliers, um, obviously there are contracts that are much, uh, much, much larger and far beyond what say an individual social enterprise could provide. And so in that case, there is a way for social enterprise to be a supplier to those larger uh, primary suppliers to city hall. So, so I think we can look at it both in terms of social enterprise supplying to city hall directly, but as well, being there to support and being integrated with the supply chains of private sector uh, uh, players. So if we think, uh, Councillor Fleury, the uh, construction uh, space, 
And if we look at the, uh, the fact that about 50% of the city's spend is in the construction area, services and related services. So I think here's a real good opportunity where we can make sure that as those firms are, are uh, soliciting uh, work from the city, they can be incorporating social enterprise into their supply chain. Thank you, uh, Michael, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Fleury. Uh, next, um, we have uh, Ian Bingham, who's a familiar face, the former Executive Director of Youth Ottawa. Ian, welcome. The floor is yours for the next five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of Council. Uh, very happy to be here on, beha on behalf of the Ottawa Community Foundation. Uh, and in support of this report. Um, also grateful for city staff for doing the work to pull it together. Uh, the Auto Community Foundation supports uh, the report recommendations and the move by the city to support economic recovery through social procurement. Um, but I, in addition to what uh, my colleagues, uh, Michael Moore and what Phil Robinson have said in the past, um, we wanna provide a lens that it, as well as an equitable economic recovery, we also see this report and the move by council as part of a very welcome support for the philanthropic sector in general and how they're gonna move the needle on some very real and pressing social challenges. I think Phil eloquently spoke about the impact that Community Laundry Co-op has. Uh, we see this happening in a range of fields and opening up social procurement to social enterprises for nonprofits and charities. On the one hand, it's gonna bring more revenues into the sector and a sector that is already hurting for revenues. It's part of that equitable economic recovery. But it's also in going through the process of qualifying as vendors, or as Michael Moore rightly pointed out, working into the supply chains of private of vendors who already exist. Um, we believe that nonprofits and charities are going to get a better sense of their business model. They're going to get a better sense of how they're creating value on the ground, of how they're delivering that value, of their cost structures. So they're going to be able to start to achieve the scale necessary to reach the magnitude of the problems as they exist in the community. And that's going to lead to some truly transformational work when we get to the intersectoral, the public, private, and philanthropic work. So we support this move both from the equitable economic recovery, but also for the impact that we think this is going to have in the philanthropic sector. We'd also like to put out that support is not just verbal here, but also what we're doing in the ground. Uh, since 2016, we've put over $3 million in grants into the development of social enterprises, working with partners like CSED. Uh, we have close to 19 million management for direct investment, direct impact investments with an ambition to further our impact investment growth. Um, we've been a key partner in the federal government's investment readiness program and working on social finance so we can get the capital necessary for growing business opportunities for nonprofits and charities to take advantage of social procurement. And finally, I'm here as the manager of the social enterprise platform, which is about bringing in the right business support at the right time for nonprofits and charities as they work towards developing their social enterprises. And so in addition to supporting the uh, philosophical side of this report, we also will support this in practice on the ground, uh, continuing to work with partners, with the city, with the United Way of Eastern Ontario, with CSED, the charities and nonprofits, uh, to promote and make the sector aware of opportunities through city of auto procurement and the supply chains of vendors who are already qualified. Again, I thank you very much for your time today and presenting in support of this report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. And a question from Councillor Dudas, please. Thank you, Ian. And, and less of a question, more of just a comment to, to thank you and Phil and Michael for your involvement to date in the, the collaborative approach to developing this report. I know the United Way is very, very involved. There's been all these different stakeholders that have come to the table. And I very much appreciated your comment about how going forward, this will be a partnership because it is truly a transformative opportunity. And I, I know when I first brought this to committee, I had no idea how much of a, of a high profile this would receive, how much enthusiasm from social enterprises and community wealth building uh, experts in the field there would be. So I wanted to thank you all for coming here today. And I know that the report itself speaks to an ongoing relationship. And I'm very grateful for you uh, reaffirming that you'll continue to work with the city to, to see this move forward. So thank you very much. Our pleasure. Great, thank you very much. So on the report is presented, carried, adopté. Carried. Thank you. Uh, our next item is um, 
a very um, innovative way of helping our small businesses uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it's the small business property tax subclass. Uh, this has been uh, uh, an item that has come up at um, our economic recovery table on numerous occasions and has uh, great support from our um, small business organizations and BIAs. So we have a presentation. Joseph uh, Mihuni has been uh, doing a, an excellent job on this file. We'll ask him to do the presentation, then open it up for questions. Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Wendy first for some opening comments. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Joseph. Bon après-midi, Monsieur le Maire, and members of the committee. Je suis Good afternoon, councillors. Mr. Mayor, I'm here with Councillor Maloney to present the subcategory of uh, for small businesses. Ben, uh, on their contributions in the report and recommendations that you have before you today. You can move to the next slide, Carol, thank you. In November, 2020, the province announced the creation of an optional small business subclass. And this subclass is a permanent one that can be used by municipalities for long-term tax planning. The province has provided flexibility to municipalities to define a small business that reflect their local circumstances. Council approved a preliminary small business tax subclass framework in the spring, and since the enabling regulations were pending, it directed staff to consult further with stakeholders and table final recommendations in the fall for implementation in 2022. Most interested municipalities are considering implementation in 2022 and beyond. And over the summer, staff held meaningful consultations with ECOBIA, the BIA Small Business Tax Subclass Working Group, the Ottawa Board of Trade, RGA, and other business stakeholders towards achieving this objective. According to the Municipal Property Tax Corporation, there's about 11,000 commercial and industrial properties in Ottawa. And StatsCan data shows that there's approximately 29,000 businesses in Ottawa. And I'll pass it over to Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, we can proceed to the next slide, Carol. <clears throat> so generally a small business can be defined by revenues, number of employees or by square footage. A small business uh, subclass that is defined by revenues or number of employees would have to be an application-based uh, process. Since the city must consider administrative aspects in creating a definition, a small business definition based on revenue or employees is not recommended. Square footage and property use information is readily available through MPAC and can be used to define a small business. The small business uh, subclass discount will only apply to the commercial and industrial tax classes. La réduction prévue pour la sous-catégorie d'imposition foncier uh the uh, financial position for small businesses would apply only to uh, commercial and industrial properties. Next slide. So MPAC assigns all, prop, uh, all properties a primary use code. Based on a review of these codes, staff have determined that the following lend themselves to a small business definition or a definition that houses small businesses. These include, but not limited to, small office, commercial with residential, commercial condo, retail in a house, small retail with office, restaurant, driving ranges, industrial condominiums, motels, daycares, among others listed on this slide. Next slide, please. This slide shows visual examples of small businesses that would meet the definition. Next slide, please. This slide shows visual examples of an industrial mall and commercial condominiums that would meet the definition. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Carol. Thank you. Uh, in addition to these properties, there are other larger properties that may house small businesses, but will need to be capped by 25,000 square feet in order to qualify. These include specialty automotive, neighborhood shopping centers, 
community shopping centers, industrial malls, multi-type complex, mixed retail, standard industrial, assembly hall and community halls, and clubs, both private and fraternal. The final recommendations capture 5,800 properties that meet the definition of a small business subclass out of the 11,000 commercial and industrial properties in Ottawa. This equates to 52% of the total commercial and industrial properties in Ottawa. The 11,000 biens commerciaux et industriels d'Ottawa, 5,800 qui répondent à la définition. There are 5,800 or 52% of properties that meet uh, the definition of small businesses. These make up 52% of all commercial and, of, and industrial properties. The 5,800 small business uh, subclass discount properties make up 15% of the total assessment and taxes uh, collected in the commercial and industrial classes, while the remaining 5,200 residual properties that will not receive the discount make up the remaining 85% of the assessment and taxes collected in the commercial and industrial classes. Staff estimate that a total of 10,000 businesses in Ottawa will benefit from this discount. From a business improvement area perspective, there are 2,700 commercial and industrial properties in Ottawa's BIAs. Of these, 1,500 or 55% of properties will receive the small business subclass discount, and the remaining 1,200 or 48% will not qualify for the discount. Next slide, please. Staff explored several aspects in determining the most appropriate discount percentage for the small business tax subclass. Staff considered revenue, revenue neutrality. Uh, in the spring of, uh, of this year, council directed staff to design a small business subclass that maintains the overall revenue levels without affecting residential properties. The cost of the discount per provincial, regula per provincial regulation would need to be absorbed within the broad commercial industri and industrial classes. Staff also considered the impact of various small uh, business subclass discount levels on residual properties in determining the final discount. This meant that deeper discounts would mean a higher increase to the residual properties in order to keep the revenues the same. Staff also considered the matching of the small business subclass discount by the province on the business education tax rate. Through the fall 2020 budget, the province committed to setting aside funds to match a small business subclass discount. The matching will be made available for municipalities that adopt the subclass uh, and apply for the matching on the education rate. Staff also considered using the small business uh, tax subclass as a tool to help small commercial properties achieve parity with those in the shopping center class. Large retail properties with over 25,000 square feet attract the shopping class rate which is 1.4 times the residential rate. In comparison, small commercial properties under 25,000 square feet attract a commercial class rate, which is 1.8 times the residential rate. As a result, large retail properties already enjoy a reduced tax rate, while smaller commercial properties do not. Staff sought to achieve a small business subclass discount that allows small businesses operating in small standalone commercial properties to pay the same as those operating in large malls and shopping centers. Staff also considered input from stakeholder consultations. What we heard from our stakeholders is that they were looking for a discount that was substantial enough for small businesses while ensuring that we were sensitive to the impact on residual properties. Finally, staff considered eliminating the excess land subclass which will reduce the impact on the residual properties. Next slide, please. Excess land is the undeveloped portion of a commercial or industrial property that already has existing structures. Previously, the province had a mandatory 30% discount for commercial properties and a 35% discount on industri industrial properties 
that had an excess land component. In 2017, the province gave municipalities the option to reduce or eliminate this discount through a provincial regulation. In the fall of 2020, the province, uh, through the provincial budget, the province further streamlined this process by allowing municipalities to eliminate or reduce this discount through a bylaw. The province itself eliminated the excess land subclass discount on the education rates in 2019. In Ottawa, there are 430 properties with an excess land component. This equates to 3.3% of the total commercial and industrial properties in Ottawa. The elimination of the excess land subclass discount in tandem with implementing uh, the small business subclass discount will soften the increase experienced by the residual properties by 0.2%. Next slide, please. Based on these considerations, uh, staff recommend a 15% small business subclass discount phased in over two years. The small business subclass discount will benefit 5,800 properties or 10,000 small businesses. Sur la base, ces éléments, le personnel recommande une réduction de... Uh, staff recommends a 15% small business sub subclass discount phased in over two years. This would help 5,800 properties or 10,000 small businesses. Staff also recommend the elimination of the excess land subclass over two years. The elimination of the subclass will impact 430 properties. The small business discount, which equates to a total of 9.9 .9 million, will be funded by 1.4 million from the elimination of the excess land subclass and the remainder from a slight increase in taxes for the 5,200 residual properties. An average small business assessed at 700,000, paying 18,500 in municipal and education taxes in 2021, will see a total reduction of 2,800 spread out equally over two years. An average commercial residual property uh, assessed at $4 million, paying $106,000 in municipal and education taxes in 2021, will see an increase of $1,500 or 1.46% 1 spread out equally over two years. I'll now pass it back to Wendy. Thank you. Well, thanks, Joseph. You can move to the next slide, Carol. So should these recommendations be approved, we're going to see uh, re changes and reductions, such as a food store in Manitick seeing a decrease of $265 in municipal taxes over two years, or a restaurant on Richmond Road will see a decrease of $3,300 in municipal taxes over two years, or a small bicycle shop uh, in St. Joseph Boulevard in Orleans will see a decrease of $1,620 in municipal taxes over two years, or a small automotive trailer shop in Stittsville Main Street seeing a discount of $3,500 in municipal taxes over a period of two years. You can move to the mm -hmm. next slide, please, Carol, thanks. The small business tax subclass information is going to be posted on Ottawa.ca in the coming weeks, and staff are going to work on a communication campaign in collaboration with ACOBIA, Ottawa, Ottawa Board of Trade, and RGA. In quarter one of 2022, staff are gonna send out a uh, targeted mail to all qualifying property owners, letting them know of uh, the discount percentage and the importance of passing this discount on to the tenants. The interim property tax information pamphlet will also advertise the new small mm -hmm. business tax subclass to create public awareness. And a list of qualifying properties will also be posted on ottawa.ca by January 31st, 2022 as required by the small business tax subclass regulation. Un liste de tous les propriétaires admissibles sera également affiché sur ottawa.ca. Qualifying properties will be posted to ottawa.ca by January 31st, 2022. Non-qualifying properties can file a request for reconsideration 
for the small business tax subclass will be able to file online for what's called a request for reconsideration and that deadline will be at the end of April 2022. Properties that qualify uh, for this new small business tax subclass and those uh, in the residual properties will see the changes in the final tax bill that is issued at the end of May in 2022. In summary, the recommended new small business tax subclass demonstrates the city's recognition of contributions of small businesses to employment, neighborhood vibrancy, and the quality of life. Merci, Monsieur le Maire. C'est la fin de cette présentation. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. This is the end of our presentation. I want to uh, take a moment to also uh, thank uh, Joseph and Wendy and their staff, but also our colleagues, uh, Councillor El Shantiri, Dudas, and Harder, uh, who have been playing a, a key role on the uh, the task force and uh, offering a lot of good uh, input, as well as those members such as Regroupement des Gens d'Affaires, uh, Ottawa Board of Trade, uh, the Council of BIAs, uh, the um, Invest Ottawa, uh, the film um, office, the music industry. It's a really great group of um, individuals who uh, who have been very very helpful in our quest to help as many small businesses as possible. So, Councillor El Shantiri, you have uh, questions or comments? The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and sincere thanks to you and my call, especially to you as the, the chair of the uh, Mayor's Task Force on Economic Recovery and our staff working so hard with everyone. Uh, question, Joseph. Uh, so some of the business who qualified, and I should have asked you that offline, I asked you a lot of questions offline, except this one, who qualified for the federal uh, $60,000 loan, which is 40 payable and 20 uh, the business owner can keep. Will that be still qualify for the, 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 uh, the tax in, in, in the city, the tax reduction, or they, because they are receiving other fund, they will not? So um, uh, thank you very much for that question, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the small businesses, it, it really it depends. So the criteria that we use to identify uh, properties that qualify for the small business subclass discount is completely independent of that federal funding that was flowing to the small businesses. So it is possible that you could have a property that does qualify for the small business tax class and also uh, did qualify to receive the federal funding that, or the loans that sort of flowed down from the federal government. Okay, thank you for that. My other question is, in your in your presentation today, you were saying that the business would qualify for that, the commercial and the light industrial. But some of the businesses where it has a subclass, like you have on the first floor commercial, but the, the second floor is residential. How would you how would you characterize this? Like, would they still qualify just for the commercial portion of the business or for both? Um, thank you very much for that question. So, Mr. Mayor, the the component of the property that will qualify for the discount is only the commercial or industrial component of a building. So, for example, if you have a building such as the one we saw in one of the slides where you have a portion of it, say, upstairs is uh, residential and the lower part is used as a, as a commercial entity, the portion that is assessed as commercial would qualify for the small business tax subclass and the portion that's assessed as residential stays status quo. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, would you uh, like us to make a comment on the report as a whole, or do you want us to come back and let my colleague make, yeah. ask their question? I'm in your hand. No, I think if you go ahead while you still have the floor, that would be great. All right. Well, again, uh, th this, is, this is a great news for the small businesses in our community. And I, I just want to say thank you to our staff, Mr. Mayor, and and and. You know, this proposed uh, tax pro eligibility property it will, you know, it, it will help the small businesses, but also the good news is will have no impact on, on the residential taxpayers. So, uh, as indicated in the report that, that uh, uh, the funding we're going to be uh, helping the small businesses this comes from the large subclass uh, businesses. This is a good news uh, for the small shop we talked about in, in our city and get the one who suffered the most uh, through this pandemic. But I, I'm, I'm grateful to see this has happened to, to our community. And I hope 
uh, and I know that's not the, the, the treasurer's job, but I hope communication in the in 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 the city will communicate this is uh, properly to uh, to the folks because sometimes when we talk to the small business, their challenge is how how would I get around this house? Could I apply? Is there's any assistance? And I remember Mr. Mayor during uh, the flood and the disaster relief from the province. Believe it or not, the province sent staff to assist the resident to fill up the form because some of the form was somewhat challenging and it takes a lot of time. So I'm just hoping as, a, as, a, as the treasurer uh, and, and staff from the, the, the treasurer department do this, the communication staff will, uh, will provide uh, a communication. Uh, it makes it uh, easy and friendly to the small business uh, because a lot, lot of times say, oh, I'm not going to spend so much time. I don't want to hire a lawyer to help me with this or a bookkeeping. If I'm not going. So I'm trying to find if there is a way we can make it friendly to apply and our staff are willing to assist if someone sent us an application and the application is not fully complete. Is there a way staff they're going to be able to help or they're just going to deny it because it does not uh, meet the you know, That's a concern I, I heard from the small businesses and I'm not sure if other colleagues heard the same, but uh, I like to see it has been downplay and become friendly use uh, when people apply. I don't know, Wendy, if you have, I talked to you a little bit about this, but I'm not sure if you'd like to comment on it. Maybe, uh, Councillor, if I could just clarify, because I think you brought up a very good point about the provincial system and so on. But this system, Wendy, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is not application-based. It's just taken, uh, it, it's reflected on your tax bill. You don't have to fill out a form. It'll be done automatically if you meet the criteria. Is that um, a fair assessment, Wendy or Joseph? Yes, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Um, it will happen automatically, but we do also plan to have an extensive communication um, and we're going to leverage all of our stakeholders that we have done so in the consultations. And uh, Councillor, if you have any questions or concerns, please um, have a conversation with us and we'll make sure that we include everybody we need to. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the reason I said that because some of the businesses who qualify from other uh, level of government the landlord choose not to lose 25%. And therefore the tenant lost everything. And we saw some places are closed. I don't want to name them here, but a big businesses lost the business because the landlord choose not to lose the 25% because the federal government that said, we'll give you a 50% discount, but then the landlord has to uh, uh, discount 25% and the tenant would only pay 25%. So we saw a lot of landlord refuse that lose 25% and they choose to shut the business down and we saw some business close. So I'm just hoping we're not at the mercy of, of the landlord or, or the mall owner. Or, like I understand the subclass, how he divided uh, both of you, which is a great job, but is it gonna be fit automatically or we still have to go through the mall owner or, or the, the, the property owner? not just the tenant of the business. Wendy or Joseph? Um, I can comment on that. Um, so the, the, the discount itself in terms of application to the account will be an automatic process. If they meet the criteria that we've outlined in the bylaw, they will automatically receive the subclass and they will automatically receive the discount. So there will be no requirement for us to engage with the landlord or to get the landlord's consent. It will show up on the property tax bill and then it should flow down um, through the normal process to the tenants. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, yeah. and thank you, Joseph and Wendy. Yeah, that's a good point, Eli, thank you. Uh, Councillor Leeper, please. Thanks, and I actually would just like to uh, quickly follow up on that. It does raise the same considerations we had when we were talking about uh, property tax deferrals at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of trying to ensure that the savings were passed on to tenants. A lot of these small businesses are in uh, buildings that are owned by larger landlords. Is that something we need to be concerned about, and do we have communications tools to help small businesses know that their landlords may be receiving this and to look for it on their own rent? 
Yes, uh, thank you very much for that question. So yes, we do have an extensive uh, built-in uh, campaign. We're gonna be working very closely uh, with our partners, so namely the BIAs, we're gonna work with Acobia, we're gonna work with uh, Ottawa Board of Trade, we're gonna work with um, uh, any other, an RGA and any, and any other business communities, uh, partners that would like to partner with us in terms of communicating. Uh, we're also going to send out uh, uh, a, a very extensive um, letter campaign just to make sure that landlords and uh, tenants eventually sort of understand that, you know, this benefit is available. There will also be information on, on Ottawa.ca. We're also going to include the listing of properties at the beginning of the year in terms of properties that qualify. So we are going to try to create as much awareness as possible in the community, especially um, in the small business community uh, and amongst tenants to make sure that they understand that this discount is coming their way. Uh, and if, you know, if they need to have some conversations with their um, uh, landlords, they're, they're free to do so. They can have those conversations. Um, and then I think we can sort of move from there in terms of, um, you know, <laughs> next steps on how we deal with this. Okay, I would um, I would suggest the the mayor was actually particularly helpful uh, on the deferrals and making sure that uh, you know the media covered the fact that the deferrals were coming and the mayor's comments were very helpful uh, to the landlords clearly saying ensure that uh, your tenants are taking advantage of uh, of this relief. Um, in the deferrals, did we get very many complaints uh, from tenants who? We're not to we're not given the advantage of, of those deferrals, or was it fairly quiet, uh, Mr. Mayor? Uh, the number of complaints that we got was was minimal. Uh, I think at the beginning we may have heard. Uh, I think uh, we I might have received a couple of complaints, okay. but uh, eventually I think it was very very minimal compared to the number of applications that we actually received and were approved. Okay. Great. Uh, and if there's any help, uh, counselors can provide in spreading word. Uh, please uh, let us know. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, that's a good point, Councillor, to maybe get it in your newsletters uh, as well, and we can share that uh, information with, with you and others. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Fleury, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and <clears throat> thank you for the fulsome presentation, uh, Wendy and, and Joseph. That was very <laughs> helpful. I have a particular question in one of the categories that is included in this, and it's particularly particular to ends. I wonder if you can comment on how we're, how um, this this relief is captured for that that group and the intent of that. Sorry, can you just repeat that, Councillor? I didn't hear for which group. For the ends, for the motels, there there's a specific uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. So, Mr. Mayor, so when we uh, defined the small business class, we picked up property use codes that we felt generally lent themselves towards the description of a small business. Uh, amongst those, I think, were in the accommodation industry. I think we had inns and motels being uh, some of those that we classified as being smaller businesses compared to some of the larger uh, hotels uh, that we did not classify as being smaller businesses. Now, if that property has a commercial component uh, on it in terms of how impact has assessed it, then the discount would apply on that commercial component for property that is an inn or property that is a motel. So generally that's, that's how staff sort of arrived at one sort of selecting uh, motels and inns uh, that do qualify uh, as small businesses. And then secondly, in terms of the mechanism on terms of how the discount flows, it would be on the component on that inn or motel that is assessed as commercial. Okay, I'll take it offline with you because I do have specific concerns for inns where um, we can barely get uh, basic life safety in place that they would get additional breaks when so in some of those properties, we actually want to see renewal of, of, of the building. But I do get the, understand the intent. My, my second question uh, relates to, um, some of the less traditional small businesses, uh, thinking of St. Bridget's uh, art, cultural art space in uh, on Cumberland, or thinking of the Rideau Sports Center, um, uh, the former Ottawa uh, ten Rideau Tennis Club, or the conversion of um, the All Saints Church on in Sandy Hill. 
I know individually they have reached it, they had reached out to me and, and I'm not looking for specific response to those, but trying to understand where it is understood that it's a small business, but in a larger footprint uh, than, than traditional, say smaller, smaller um, storefronts. So I, I wonder how those were either considered or captured in your, uh, in the report. Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, so in, in addition to some of the ones that uh, I think we read out, uh, some of the property uses we read out in the uh, presentation, there's a couple more that we've included in the bylaw that may capture some of the ones, uh, prop uh, categories that you've mentioned. However, when we designed the small business uh, subclass discount, we had to go based on um, the general uh, property use or the primary property use of the property. So MPAC does assign a primary property use to the property. For example, I think you, you gave the example of the church there, that, and there is a business that sort of is operating from, from the church. So if the primary use of the property is defined as a church, then we would not have picked it up as being a small business. And therefore, if there's any commercial component that does apply to that property, then there would not be a discount that would flow. So we went strictly based on the information that um, MPAC has provided in terms of primary property use. And this was really to help with that, uh, the automation of the process and sort of cure some of the issues that I think uh, <clears throat> Councillor Eli uh, had talked about in terms of, you know, getting rid of the application and sort of trying to automate this so that we can make it a little simpler for small businesses. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thanks. Councillor Cavanaugh, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Mahoney. Um, uh, I, uh, I've already been in discussions with you, and um, I just wanted to go over the questions that I asked because it was to do with franchises and, um, and how they fit into the small business category. So if you could outline that, I think that'd be, help be helpful for committee members. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kavanaugh. So Mr. Mayor, we, we did uh, review uh, the issue of franchises specifically as it relates to restaurants and fast foods uh, uh, properties here in Ottawa. And we found that I think uh, of the total category uh, uh, of um, restaurants and fast foods, they made up about 3% of the total number of properties that would be receiving the discount. Uh, further, when we kind of look at national chains, they only made up 1.1% of the total properties that would be receiving the discount. Now, um, it would be difficult for us to sort of uh, distinguish which properties, based on the information that we have, uh, to, in an automated fashion, distinguish which properties are either franchised or owned uh, by the corporate national chains. Uh, with regards to franchises, based on our research and sort of talking to some of our partners, I think we came to an understanding that franchises uh, are very, operate very much in, in a very similar fashion to small businesses. They have to pay a hefty fee uh, for their advertising and for the publicity that they actually get by carrying those big name brands, and therefore that eats significantly into their margin. So in terms of including franchisees, uh, franchises as a part of that small business discount. The thinking was that I think they're, in terms of you know, their margins or how well they're faring, I think they, can be com they are comparable to other small businesses that are not franchises. And therefore, I don't think it would be fair to, to leave them out because one of our guiding principles was fairness and equity. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, I think uh, it would be difficult even if we had to go in and sort of split out the franchises from the um, corporate chains, uh, you know, properties that are owned by the corporate offices for such a small percentage amount of about 1% of properties. So I think the conclusion that staff came to was that I think it was, um, we were comfortable in terms of fairness and equity to include restaurants and to include um, fast foods uh, as part of the small business uh, subclass and have them receive the discount so that we uh, would err, I think, to the benefit of small businesses that were in that cat category, rather than err on the side of, uh, you know, the, the corporate chains, the few corporate chains that might be in there. Okay, thank you. I think that was important to hear because um, it was a question um, I raised, but um, I, I think residents would wonder too, how does this affect importance in McDonald's? Um, because 
they're in there too. So that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good point, Councillor. Um, Councillor Dudas, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I just wanted to, for clarification as well to Wendy and Joseph, um, this will come into effect in 2022 and this isn't a one-time deal. Can you clarify on the length of time that this will benefit our small businesses for and why you determined to do it uh, for longevity? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, so this, the, the small business subclass uh, discount, um, when we started looking at it, uh, we were looking at this as part of our long-term tax policy. Um, you know, I think the timing of it, uh, I think sort of might have been tied, uh, you know, in terms of how it may, it may have been presented was might have been tied to perhaps COVID relief. But in terms of how we approached it, we approached it from a long term tax policy approach. And we see this as a tool, I think, that helps to sort of create more fairness, especially for small businesses that pay that higher tax rate, you know, that we talked about. They pay 1.8 times. Uh, the residential rate, whereas, you know, similar small businesses that are operating from larger shopping centers and larger malls uh, only pay the, shop, pay the shopping rate, which is only 1.4 times the uh, 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 residential rate. So I think by introducing this tool, we're helping sort of to create some sort of parity, meaning that it doesn't really matter where a small business rents, um, whether they're renting a small standalone commercial property or they're renting in a larger mall, their tax burden will generally be the same. So we're looking at this more as a long-term thing. We're not doing it as a pilot or as a two-year trial. I think we want to bake it in into our ongoing tax policy and have it become a part of our long-term uh, outlook. No, and, and it's appreciated. And there's been an immense amount of work behind the scenes by Wendy, Joseph, your whole team to get this right. And I do appreciate all the work that you've done, uh, as well as all of our partners in the business community to provide their input. Once again, this is the city demonstrating that we're investing in our small businesses and it's not just helping those owners, it's helping all their employees. And it trickles back into our own economy and shows that we are open for business despite the pandemic and going forward for the long term. So I'm very much appreciative to see this report. I can't wait to uh, hear back from our businesses as they start to see the benefits coming in in 2022. And once again, to see more of our businesses either open or, um, or make it through this pandemic. So very much appreciated. Yeah, that's a very good point, uh, Councillor Dudas. And, and you think of other things. You know, we have limited tools in our toolkit to help businesses because of this will act. But I know, for instance, Councillor Tierney and his committee, uh, you know, with council support, waived the patio fees that saved. I know one pub uh, on Elgin Street or on the Preston Street saved eight thousand dollars. So these things add up, and that that's you know a part-time employee's uh, wages uh, over the summertime. So. Thank you all very much for your input and to Joseph and um, uh, Wendy and Matthew Gravel in my office and our three co-chairs of the Economic Task Force, Laura and Eli and Jan. We very much appreciate uh, uh, your input and on the report as presented, carried, adopted. Carried. You'll carried. See. Uh, next is uh, <clears throat> a light rail transit legal update in camera, reporting out, not, uh, not to be reported out. We'll begin by resolving in camera regarding light rail transit, a legal update. I'll ask Vice Chair Dudas to read the motion to resolve in camera, please. Councillor Dudas. Thank you. Um, be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee resolve in camera to receive and consider the light rail transit legal update pursuant to the procedure bylaw subsection 13.1e, litigation or potential litigation affecting the city and 13.1f, the receiving of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. Reporting out date not to be reported out. On the motion carried, and update. We'll take a five minute to break to allow members to leave the Zoom meeting and join the MS Teams meeting, as well as to allow clerk staff to stop the Zoom meeting. Thank you, merci. <laughs> 